Diga Nikaya Sutta number five Kuta Danta Sutta Kuta Danta and the Bloodless Sacrifice Thus have I heard Once the Lord was travelling through Magadha with a large company of some five hundred bhikkhus, and he arrived at a Brahmin village called Kanumata, and there he stayed at the Ambalatika park. Now at that time the Brahmin Kutadanta was living at Kanumata, a populous place, full of grass, timber, water and corn which had been given to him by King Senia Bimbisara of Magatha as a royal gift and with royal powers. Kutadanta planned a great sacrifice at that time. Seven hundred bulls, seven hundred bullocks, seven hundred heifers, seven hundred goats and seven hundred rams were all tied up to the sacrificial posts. And the Brahmins and householders of Kanumata heard that the Reklus Gotama, the son of the Sakyans, who went forth from the Sakyan clan, has been travelling through Magadha with a large company of some five hundred bhikkhus, and was now staying at Ambalatika. Now a good report of Master Gotama has been spread to this effect. The Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable, leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, with its princes and its people which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is good to see such arahants. And indeed, the Brahmins and householders, leaving Kanumata, in great numbers, went to Ambalatika. Just then, Kutadanta had gone up to his veranda for his midday rest. Seeing all the Brahmins and householders making for Ambalatika, he asked his steward the reason. The steward replied, Sir, it is the ascetic Gautama, concerning whom a good report has been made that the Blessed One is accomplished, fully awakened, perfect in true knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, with its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is good to see such arahants. That is why they are going to see him. Then Kudadanta thought, I have heard that the ascetic Gotama understands how to conduct successfully the triple sacrifice with its sixteen requisites. Now I do not understand all this, but I want to make a big sacrifice. Suppose I were to go to the recluse Gotama and ask him about the matter. So he sent his steward to the Brahmins and householders of Kanumata to ask them to wait for him. And at that time, several hundred Brahmins were staying at Kanumata, intending to take part in Kudadanta's sacrifice. Hearing of his intention to visit the Reklus Gotama, they went and asked him if this were true. So it is, gentlemen, I am going to visit the Reklus Gotama. Sir, 
Do not visit the recluse Gotama. It is not proper for Venerable Kutadanta to go see the recluse Gotama. Venerable Kutadanta is well born on both the mother's and the father's side, of pure descent to the seventh generation, unbroken of irreproachable birth, and therefore he should not call on the recluse Gotama, but rather the recluse Gotama should call on him. The venerable Kutadanta is possessed of great wealth and resources. The venerable Kutadanta is a scholar versed in the mantras accomplished in the three Vedas, a skilled expounder of the rules, the lore of sounds and meanings and fifthly oral tradition, an expounder fully versed in natural philosophy and the marks of a great man. The venerable Kutadanta is handsome, good-looking, pleasing, of the most beautiful complexion, in form and countenance like Brahma, of no mean appearance. He is virtuous of increasing virtue, endowed with increasing virtue. He is well-spoken, of pleasing address, polite, of pure and clear enunciation, speaking to the point. He is the teacher's teacher of many, teaching the mantras to three hundred youths, and many young men come from different districts and regions seeking to learn the mantras in his presence, desires to learn them from him. He is aged, grown old, venerable, advanced in years, long past his youth, whereas the reckless Gotama is youthful and newly gone forth as a wanderer. The venerable Kutadanta is esteemed, made much of, honored, revered, worshipped by King Senia Bimbisara and by the Brahmin Pokarasati. He lives in Khanumata, a populous place, full of grass, timber, water, and corn, which has been given to him by King Senia Bimbisara of Magadha as a royal gift and with royal powers. This being so, it is not proper that he should visit the recluse Gotama, but rather the recluse Gotama should visit him. Then Kutadanta said to the Brahmins, Now listen, gentlemen, as to why it is fitting for us to visit the recluse Gotama, and why it is not fitting for him to visit us. The recluse Gotama is well born on both sides of pure descent to the seventh generation, unbroken of irreproachable birth. Therefore, it is fitting for us to visit him. He went forth, leaving a great body of kinsmen. In fact, he gave up much gold and wealth to go forth, both hidden away and openly displayed. The recluse Gotama, while youthful, a black-haired youth in the prime of his young days, in the first stage of life, went forth from the home life into homelessness, leaving his grieving parents weeping with tear-stained faces, having cut off his hair and beard and put on saffron robes. He went forth into homelessness. He is virtuous of increasing virtue, endowed with increasing virtue. He is well-spoken, of pleasing address, polite, of pure and clear enunciation, speaking to the point, the teacher's teacher of many. He has abandoned sensuality and dispelled vanity. He teaches action and the results of action, honoring the blameless Brahmin way of life. He is a wanderer of high birth, of a leading Kattiya family. He is a wanderer from a wealthy family of great wealth and possessions. People come to consult him from foreign kingdoms and foreign lands. Many thousands of devas have taken refuge in him. In fact, this good report has been spread about him. The Blessed Lord is an arahant, a fully awakened Buddha, perfected in knowledge and conduct, sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed, teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. 
He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, with its princes and its people, which he has himself realized with direct knowledge. He teaches the Dhamma that is good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. Now it is good to see such arahants. He bears the thirty-two marks of a great man. He is welcoming, kindly of speech, courteous, genial, clear, and ready of speech. He is attended by four assemblies, revered, honored, esteemed, and worshipped by them. Many devas and humans are devoted to him. Whenever he stays in any town or village, that place is not troubled by non-human beings. He has a crowd, a multitude of followers, is a teacher of many. He is consulted by the chief of the various leaders of sects. It is not the way with the recluse Gotama's reputation as it is with that of some ascetics and Brahmins, about whom this or that is reported. The recluse Gotama's fame is based on his achievement of unsurpassed wisdom and conduct. Indeed, King Senya Bimbisara of Magadha has gone for refuge to him together with his son, his wife, his followers, and his ministers. So have King Pasenadi of Kosala and the Brahmin Pokarasati. He is revered, honored, esteemed, and worshipped by them. The recluse Gotama has arrived in Kanumata and is staying at Ambalatika. And whatever recluses or Brahmins come to our territory are our guests and should be treated as such. Therefore, it is not proper that he should come to us, but rather we should go to him. However much I might praise the recluse Gotama, that praise is insufficient. He is beyond all praise. On hearing this, the Brahmin said, Sir, since you praise the recluse Gotama so much, then even if he were to live a hundred yojanas from here, it would be fitting for a believing clansman to go with a shoulder bag to visit him. And sir, we shall go to visit the recluse Gotama as well. And so Kutadanta went with a large company of Brahmins to Ambalatika, Approaching the Lord, Kutadanta exchanged courtesies with him and sat down to one side. Some of the Brahmins and householders of Kanumata made obeisance to the Lord. Some exchanged courtesies with him. Some saluted him with joined hands. Some announced their name and clan, and some sat down to one side in silence. Sitting to one side, Kutadanta addressed the Lord. Venerable Sir, I have heard that you understand how to conduct successfully the triple sacrifice with its sixteen requisites. Now I do not understand all this, but I want to make a big sacrifice. It would be good if the recluse Gotama were to explain this to me. Then listen, Brahmin. Pay proper attention, and I will explain. Yes, sir, said Kutadanta, and the Lord said, Brahmin, once upon a time there was a king called Mahavijita. He was rich, of great wealth and resources, with an abundance of gold and silver, of possessions and requisites, of money and money's worth, with a full treasury and granary. And when King Mahavijita was musing in private, the thought came to him, I have acquired extensive wealth in human terms. I occupy a wide extent of land which I have conquered. Suppose now I were to make a great sacrifice which would be to my benefit and happiness for a long time. And calling his minister chaplain, he told him his thought. I want to make a big sacrifice. Instruct me, revered sir, how this may be to my lasting benefit and happiness. 
the chaplain replied, Your Majesty's country is beset by thieves. It is ravaged. Villages and towns are being destroyed. The countryside is infested with brigands. If Your Majesty were to tax this region, that would be the wrong thing to do. Suppose Your Majesty were to think, I will get rid of this plague of robbers by executions and imprisonment, or by confiscation, threats and banishment. The plague would not be properly ended. Those who survived would later harm Your Majesty's realm. However, with this plan you can completely eliminate the plague. To those in the kingdom who are engaged in cultivating crops and raising cattle, let Your Majesty distribute grain and fodder. To those in trade, give capital. To those in government, service, assign proper living wages. Then those people, being intent on their own occupations, will not harm the kingdom. Your Majesty's revenues will be great, the land will be tranquil and not be set by thieves, and the people, with joy in their hearts, will play with their children, and will dwell in open houses. And saying, So be it, the king accepted the chaplain's advice. He gave grain and fodder, capital to those in trade, proper living wages, and the people with joy in their hearts dwelt in open houses. Then King Mahavijita sent for the chaplain and said, I have got rid of the plague of robbers. Following your plan, my revenue has grown. The land is tranquil and not beset by thieves. And the people with joy in their hearts play with their children and dwell in open houses. Now I wish to make a great sacrifice. Instruct me as to how this may be done to my lasting benefit and happiness. For this, sire, you should send for your katiyas from town and country, your advisers and counselors, the most influential brahmins and the wealthy householders of your realm, and say to them, I wish to make a great sacrifice. Assist me in this, gentlemen, that it may be to my lasting benefit and happiness. The king agreed, and did so. Sire, let the sacrifice begin. Now is the time, your majesty. These four assenting groups will be the accessories for the sacrifice. King Mahavijita is endowed with eight things. He is well born on both sides, of irreproachable birth. He is handsome, good-looking, pleasing, of the most beautiful complexion, in form and countenance, like Brahma, of no mean appearance. He is virtuous, of increasing virtue. He is well spoken, of pleasing address, polite, of pure and clear enunciation, speaking to the point. He is rich, with a full treasury and granary. He is powerful, having a four-branched army that is loyal, dependable, making bright his reputation among his enemies. He is a faithful giver and host, not shutting his door against recluses, brahmins and wayfarers, beggars and the needy, a fountain of goodness. He is very learned in what should be learnt. He knows the meaning of whatever is said, saying, This is what that means. He is a scholar, accomplished, wise, competent to perceive advantage in the past, the future, or the present. King Mahavijita is endowed with these eight things. These constitute the accessories for the sacrifice. The Brahmin chaplain is endowed with four things. He is well born. He is a scholar versed in the mantras. He is virtuous of increasing virtue, endowed with increasing virtue. He is learned, accomplished and wise, and is the first or second to hold the sacrificial ladle. He has these four qualities. These constitute the accessories to the sacrifice. Then, prior to the sacrifice, the Brahmin chaplain taught the king the three modes. 
it might be that your majesty might have some regrets about the intended sacrifice. I am going to lose a lot of wealth, or during the sacrifice, I am losing a great deal of wealth, or after the sacrifice, I have lost a great deal of wealth. In such cases, your majesty should not entertain such regrets. Then, prior to the sacrifice, the chaplain dispelled the king's qualms with ten conditions for the recipient. Sire, there will come to the sacrifice those who take life and those who abstain from taking life. And those who take life, so will it be to them. But those who abstain from taking life will have a successful sacrifice and will rejoice in it, and their hearts may be calmed within. There will come those who take what is not given and those who refrain from taking what is not given. There will come those who indulge in sexual misconduct and those who refrain from indulging in sexual conduct. There will come those who will tell lies and those who will not tell lies. There will come those who indulge in calumny, harsh and frivolous speech and those who do not indulge in calumny, harsh and frivolous speech. There will come those who are covetous and those who are not, those who harbor ill will and those who do not, those who have wrong views and those who have right views. To those who have wrong views it will turn out accordingly, but those who have right views will have a successful sacrifice and will rejoice in it and their hearts may be calmed within. So the chaplain dispelled the king's doubts with ten conditions. So the chaplain instructed the king, who was making the great sacrifice with sixteen reasons, urged him, inspired him, and gladdened his heart. Someone might say, King Mahavijita is making a great sacrifice, but he has not invited his katiyas his advisers and counselors, the most influential Brahmins and wealthy householders. But such words would not be in accordance with the truth, since the king has invited them. Thus the king may know that he will have a successful sacrifice and rejoice in it, and his heart will be calmed within. Or someone might say, King Mahavijita is making a great sacrifice, but he is not well born on both sides but such words would not be in accordance with the truth. Or someone might say, His chaplain is not well born, but such words would not be in accordance with the truth. Thus the chaplain instructed the king with sixteen reasons. In this sacrifice, Brahmin, no bulls were slain, no goats or sheep, no roosters and pigs nor were various living beings subjected to slaughter, nor were trees cut down for sacrificial posts, nor were grasses mown or the sacrificial grass, and those who are called slaves or servants or workmen did not perform their tasks for fear of blows or threats, weeping and in tears. But those who wanted to do something did it, those who did not wish to, did not. They did what they wanted to, and not what they did not want to do. The sacrifice was carried out with ghee, oil, butter, curds, honey, and molasses. Then, Brahmin, the Khatiyas, the ministers and counselors, the influential Brahmins, the wealthy householders of town and country, having received a sufficient income, came to King Mahavijita and said, We have brought sufficient wealth, your majesty. Please accept it. But, gentlemen, I have collected together sufficient wealth. Whatever is left over, you take away. At the king's refusal, they went away to one side and consulted together. It is not right for us to take this wealth back to our homes. The king is making a great sacrifice. Let us follow his example. Then the Khatiyas put their gifts to the east of the sacrificial pit. The advisers and counselors set out theirs to the south, the Brahmins to the west, and the wealthy householders to the north. 
and in this sacrifice no bulls were slain, no goats or sheep, no roosters and pigs, nor were various living beings subjected to slaughter, nor were trees cut down for sacrificial posts, nor were grasses mown for the sacrificial grass, and those who are called slaves or servants or workmen did not perform their tasks for fear of blows or threats, weeping and in tears. But those who wanted to do something did it. Those who did not wish to did not. They did what they wanted to do, and not what they did not want to do. The sacrifice was carried out with ghee, oil, butter, curds, honey, and molasses. Thus there were the four assenting groups, and King Mahavijita was endowed with eight things, and the chaplain with four things in three modes. This Brahmin is called the sixteenfold successful sacrifice in three modes. At this the Brahmins shouted loudly and noisily, What a splendid sacrifice! What a splendid way to perform a sacrifice! But Kutadanta sat in silence, and the Brahmins asked him why he did not applaud the recluse Gotama's fine words. He replied, It is not that I do not applaud them. My head would split open if I did not. But it strikes me that the recluse Gotama does not say, I have heard this, or it must have been like this. But he says, it was like this or like that at that time. And so, gentlemen, it seems to me that the recluse Gotama must have been at that time either King Mahavijita, the lord of the sacrifice, or else the Brahmin chaplain who conducted the sacrifice for him. Does the recluse Gotama acknowledge that he performed or caused to be performed such a sacrifice, and that in consequence at death, after the breakup of the body, he was reborn in a good sphere, in a heavenly state? I do, Brahmin. I was the Brahmin chaplain who conducted that sacrifice. And, Venerable Sir, is there any other sacrifice that is simpler, less difficult, more fruitful and profitable that this threefold sacrifice with its sixteen attributes? There is, Brahmin. What is it, Venerable Sir? Wherever regular family gifts are given to virtuous recluses, these constitute a sacrifice more fruitful and profitable than that. Why, Venerable Sir, and for what reason is this better? Brahmin, it is because no arahants or those who have attained the arahant path will attend such a sacrifice. Why? Because there they see beatings and throttlings, so they do not attend. But they will attend the sacrifice at which regular families, gifts are given to virtuous recluses. Because there there are no beatings or throttlings, that is why this kind of sacrifice is more fruitful and profitable. But, Venerable Sir, is there any other sacrifice that is more profitable than either of these? There is, Brahmin. What is it, Venerable Sir? Brahmin, if anyone provides shelter for the Sangha coming from the four quarters, that constitutes a more profitable sacrifice. But, Venerable Sir, is there any sacrifice that is more profitable than these three? There is, Brahmin. What is it, Venerable Sir? Brahmin, if anyone with a pure heart goes for refuge to the Buddha, the Dhamma, and the Sangha, that constitutes a sacrifice more profitable than any of these three. But, Venerable Sir, is there any sacrifice that is more profitable than these four? There is, Brahmin. What is it, Venerable Sir? Brahmin, if anyone with a pure heart undertakes the precepts to refrain from taking life, 
from taking what is not given, from sexual immorality, from lying speech and from taking strong drink and sloth producing drugs, that constitutes a sacrifice more profitable than any of these four. But, venerable sir, is there any sacrifice that is more profitable than these five? There is, Brahmin. What is it, venerable sir? Brahmin, a tatagata appears in the world. An arahant, a fully awakened Buddha, endowed with wisdom and conduct. Sublime, knower of worlds, incomparable leader of persons to be tamed teacher of gods and humans, enlightened, blessed. He declares this world with its gods, its maras, and its brahmas, this generation with its recluses and brahmins, its princes, and its people, which he has himself realized by direct knowledge. He teaches the dhamma, good in the beginning, good in the middle, and good in the end, with the right meaning and phrasing, and he reveals a holy life that is utterly perfect and pure. A householder or householder's son or one born in some other clan hears that Dhamma. On hearing the Dhamma, he acquires faith in the Tathagata. Possessing that faith, he considers thus, household life is crowded and dusty. Life gone forth is wide open. It is not easy, while living in a home, to lead the holy life utterly perfect and pure as a polished shell. Suppose I shave off my hair and beard, put on the saffron robe, and goes forth from the home life into homelessness. When he has thus gone forth, he lives restrained by the restraint of the Pati Mukha, possessed of proper behavior and resort. Having taken up the rules of training, he trains himself in them, seeing danger in the slightest faults. He comes to be endowed with wholesome bodily and verbal action. His lifestyle is purified, and he is possessed of moral discipline. He guards the doors of his sense faculties, is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension, and is content. And how, Brahmin, is the bhikkhu possessed of moral discipline? Herein, Brahmin, having abandoned the destruction of life, the bhikkhu abstains from the destruction of life. He has laid down the rod and weapon and dwells conscientious, full of kindness, compassion for the welfare of all living beings. This pertains to his moral discipline. Having abandoned taking what is not given, he abstains from taking what is not given. Accepting and expecting only what is given, he lives in honesty with a pure mind. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Having abandoned non-celibacy, he leads the holy life of celibacy. He dwells aloof and abstains from the vulgar practice of sexual intercourse. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Having abandoned false speech, he abstains from false speech. He speaks only the truth. He lives devoted to truth, trustworthy and reliable. He does not deceive anyone in the world. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Having abandoned slander, he abstains from slander. He does not repeat elsewhere what he has heard here in order to divide others from the people here. Nor does he repeat here what he has heard elsewhere, in order to divide these people from those. Thus he is a reconciler of those who are divided, and a promoter of friendships. Rejoicing, delighting, and exulting in concord, he speaks only words that are conducive to concord. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Having abandoned harsh speech, he abstains from harsh speech. He speaks only such words as are gentle, pleasing to the ear, endearing, going to the heart, polite, amiable, and agreeable to the many folk. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Having abandoned idle chatter, he abstains from idle chatter. 
He speaks at the right time, speaks what is factual and beneficial, speaks on the Dhamma and the discipline. His words are worth treasuring. They are timely, backed by reasons, measured and connected with the good. This too pertains to his moral discipline. He abstains from damaging seed and plant life. He eats only in one part of the day, refraining from food at night and from eating at improper times. He abstains from dancing, singing, instrumental music and from witnessing unsuitable shows. He abstains from wearing garlands, embellishing himself with scents and beautifying himself with unguents. He abstains from high and luxurious beds and seats. He abstains from accepting gold and silver. He abstains from accepting uncooked grain, raw meat, women and girls, male and female slaves, goats and sheep, fowl and swine, elephants, cattle, horses and mares. He abstains from accepting fields and lands. He abstains from running messages and errands. He abstains from buying and selling. He abstains from dealing with false weights, false metals and false measures. He abstains from the crooked ways of bribery, deception and fraud. He abstains from mutilating, executing, imprisoning, robbery, plunder and violence. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, continually cause damage to seed and plant life, to plants propagated from roots, stems, joints, buds, and seeds, he abstains from damaging seed and plant life. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the use of stored-up goods, such as stored-up food, drinks, garments, vehicles, bedding, scents, and comestibles. He abstains from the use of stored-up goods. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, attend unsuitable shows, such as shows featuring dancing, singing or instrumental music, theatrical performances, narrations of legends, music played by hand clapping, cymbals and drums, picture houses, acrobatic performances, combats of elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, goats, rams, roosters and quails, stick fights, boxing and wrestling, sham fights, roll calls, battle arrays and regimental reviews. He abstains from attending such unsuitable shows. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, indulge in the following games and recreations, games played on an eight-row or ten-row chessboard, games played by imagining a board in the air, hopscotch, spillikins, dice games, hitting short sticks with long sticks, Games played by dipping the hand in paint or dye. Games involving toy pipes made of leaves, ball games, plowing with miniature plows, turning somersaults, playing with paper windmills, with toy measures, with toy chariots, toy bows, guessing at letters written in the air or on one's back, guessing others' thoughts or charades. He abstains from such games that are a basis for negligence. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the use of high and luxurious beds and seats, such as spacious couches, thrones with animal figures carved on the supports, long-haired coverlets, multi-colored patchwork coverlets, white woolen coverlets, woolen coverlets embroidered with flowers, quilts stuffed with cotton, woolen coverlets embroidered with animal figures, woolen coverlets with hair on both sides or on one side, bed threads embroidered with gems, silk coverlets, dance hall carpets, elephant, horse or chariot rugs, rugs of antelope skin, choice spreads made of kadali deer hides, 
spreads with red awnings overhead, couches with red cushions for head and feet. He abstains from the use of such high and luxurious beds and seats. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on food offered by the faithful, enjoy the use of such devices for embellishing and beautifying themselves as the following, rubbing scented powders into the body, massaging with oils, bathing in perfumed water, kneading the limbs, mirrors, ointments, garlands, scents, unguents, face powders, makeup, bracelets, headbands, decorated walking sticks, ornamented medicine tubes, rapiers, sunshades, embroidered sandals, turbans, diadems, yak-tail whisks, and long-fringed white robes. He abstains from the use of such devices for embellishment and beautification. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in frivolous chatter, such as talk about kings, thieves, and ministers of state, talk about armies, dangers, and wars, talk about food, drink, garments, and lodgings, talk about garlands and scents, Talk about relations, vehicles, villages, towns, cities, and countries. Talk about women and talk about heroes. Street talk and talk by the well. Talk about those departed in days gone by. Rambling chit-chat, speculations about the world and about the sea. Talk about gain and loss. He abstains from such frivolous chatter. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in wrangling argumentation, saying to one another, You don't understand this doctrine and discipline. It is I who understand this doctrine and discipline. How can you understand this doctrine and discipline? You're practicing the wrong way. I am practicing the right way. I'm being consistent, while you're inconsistent. What should have been said first, you said last. What should have been said last, you said first. What you took so long to think out has been confuted. Your doctrine has been refuted. You're defeated. Go, try to save your doctrine, or disentangle yourself now, if you can. He abstains from such wrangling argumentation. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in running messages and errands for kings, ministers of state, Kattiyas, Brahmins, householders or youths, who command them, Go here, go there, take this, bring that from there. He abstains from running such messages and errands. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, engage in scheming, talking, hinting, belittling others, and pursuing gain with gain, he abstains from such kinds of scheming and talking. This, too, pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by a wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as predicting long life, prosperity, etc., or the reverse, from the marks on a person's limbs, hands, feet, etc., divining by means of omens and signs, making auguries on the basis of thunderbolts and celestial portents, interpreting ominous dreams, telling fortunes from marks on the body, making auguries from the marks on cloth gnawed by mice, offering fire oblations, offering oblations from a ladle, offering oblations of husks, rice powder, rice grains, ghee, and oil to the gods, offering oblations from the mouth, offering blood sacrifices to the gods, making predictions based on the fingertips, determining whether the site for a proposed house or garden is beneficial or not, making predictions for officers of state, laying demons in a cemetery, laying ghosts, 
knowledge of charms to be pronounced by one living in an earthen house. Snake charming, the poison craft, scorpion craft, rat craft, bird craft, crow craft, foretelling the number of years that a man has to live, reciting charms to give protection from arrows, reciting charms to understand the language of animals. He abstains from such wrong means of lifestyle, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as interpreting the significance of the color, shape, and other features of the following items, to determine whether they portend fortune or misfortune for their owners gems, garments, staffs, swords, spears, arrows, bows, and other weapons, women, men, boys, girls, slaves, slave women, elephants, horses, buffaloes, bulls, cows, goats, rams, fowl, quails, lizards, house gables, tortoises, and other animals. He abstains from such wrong means of lifestyle, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as making predictions to the effect that the king will march forth, the king will return, our king will attack and the enemy king will retreat. Our enemy king will attack and our king will retreat. Our king will triumph and the enemy king will be defeated. The enemy king will triumph and our king will be defeated. Thus there will be victory for one and defeat for the other. He abstains from such wrong means of lifestyle, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by a wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as predicting, there will be an eclipse of the moon, an eclipse of the sun, an eclipse of a constellation. The sun and the moon will go on their proper courses. There will be an aberration of the sun and moon. The constellations will go on their proper courses there will be an aberration of a constellation. There will be a fall of meteors. There will be a sky blaze. There will be an earthquake. There will be an earth roar. There will be a rising and setting, a darkening and brightening of the moon, sun, and constellations. Such will be the result of the moon's eclipse such the result of the sun's eclipse, and so on, and down to, such will be the result of the rising and setting, darkening and brightening of the moon, sun, and constellations. He abstains from such wrong means of lifestyle, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as predicting, there will be abundant rain, there will be a drought, there will be a good harvest, there will be a famine, there will be security, there will be danger, there will be sickness, there will be health, or they earn their living by accounting, computation, calculation, the composing of poetry, and speculations about the world. He abstains from such wrong means of livelihood, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as arranging auspicious dates for marriages, both those in which the bride is brought home and those in which she is sent out, arranging auspicious dates for betrothals and divorces, arranging auspicious dates for the accumulation or expenditure of money, reciting charms to make people lucky or unlucky, rejuvenating the fetuses of abortive women, reciting spells to bind a man's tongue, 
to paralyze his jaw, to make him lose control over his hands, or to bring on deafness, obtaining oracular answers to questions by means of a mirror, a girl, or a god, worshipping the sun, worshipping Mahabrahma, bringing forth flames from the mouth, invoking the goddess of luck. He abstains from such wrong means of lifestyle, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Whereas some recluses and Brahmins, while living on the food offered by the faithful, earn their living by wrong means of lifestyle, by such debased arts as promising gifts to deities in return for favors, fulfilling such promises, demonology, reciting spells after entering an earthen house, inducing virility and impotence, preparing and consecrating sites for a house, giving ceremonial mouthwashes and ceremonial bathing, offering sacrificial fires, administering emetics, purgatives, expectorants, and phlegmagogues, administering medicines through the ear and through the nose, administering ointments and counter-ointments, practicing fine surgery on the eyes and ears, practicing general surgery on the body, practicing as a children's doctor. He abstains from such wrong means of lifestyle, from such debased arts. This too pertains to his moral discipline. Brahmin, the bhikkhu who is thus possessed of moral discipline, sees no danger anywhere in regard to his restraint by moral discipline. Just as a head-anointed noble warrior who has defeated his enemies, sees no danger anywhere from his enemies. So the bhikkhu who is thus possessed of moral discipline sees no danger anywhere in regard to his restraint by moral discipline. Endowed with this noble aggregate of moral discipline, he experiences within himself a blameless happiness. In this way, Brahmin, the bhikkhu is possessed of moral discipline. And how, Brahmin, does the bhikkhu guard the doors of his sense faculties? Herein, Brahmin, having seen a form with the eye, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the eye, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the eye, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the eye. Having heard a sound with the ear, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the ear, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the ear, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the ear. Having smelled an odor with the nose, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the nose, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the nose, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the nose. Having tasted a flavor with the tongue, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the signs or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the tongue, even unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the tongue, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the tongue. Having touched a tangible object with the body, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the body, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, guards the faculty of the body, and achieves restraint over the faculty of the body. Having cognized a mind object with the mind, the bhikkhu does not grasp at the sign or the details, since if he were to dwell without restraint over the faculty of the mind, evil unwholesome states such as covetousness and grief might assail him. He practices restraint, 
guards the faculty of the mind and achieves restraint over the faculty of the mind. Endowed with this noble restraint of the sense faculties, he experiences within himself an unblemished happiness. In this way, Brahman, the bhikkhu guards the doors of the sense faculties. And how, Brahman, is the bhikkhu endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension? Herein, Brahman, in going forward and returning, the bhikkhu acts with clear comprehension. In looking ahead and looking aside, he acts with clear comprehension. In bending and stretching the limbs, he acts with clear comprehension. In wearing his robes and cloak and using his alms bowl, he acts with clear comprehension. In eating, drinking, chewing and tasting, he acts with clear comprehension. In defecating and urinating, he acts with clear comprehension. In going, standing, sitting, lying down, waking up, speaking and remaining silent, he acts with clear comprehension. In this way, Brahman, the bhikkhu is endowed with mindfulness and clear comprehension. And how, Brahman, is the bhikkhu content? Herein, Brahman, a bhikkhu is content with robes to protect his body and alms food to sustain his belly. Wherever he goes, he sets out, taking only his requisites along with him. Just as a bird, wherever it goes, flies with its wings as its only burden. In the same way, a bhikkhu is content with robes to protect his body and alms food to sustain his belly. Wherever he goes, he sets out, taking only his requisites along with him. In this way, Brahman, the bhikkhu, is content. Endowed with this noble aggregate of moral discipline, this noble restraint over the sense faculties, this noble mindfulness and clear comprehension, and this noble contentment, he resorts to a secluded dwelling, a forest, the foot of a tree, a mountain, a glen, a hillside cave, a cremation ground, a jungle thicket, the open air, a heap of straw. After returning from his alms round, following his meal, he sits down, crosses his legs, holds his body erect, and sets up mindfulness before him. Having abandoned covetousness for the world, he dwells with a mind free from covetousness. He purifies his mind from covetousness. Having abandoned ill will and hatred, he dwells with loving kindness and compassion for the welfare of all living beings. He purifies his mind from ill will and hatred. Having abandoned dullness and drowsiness, he dwells perceiving light, mindful and clearly comprehending. He purifies his mind from dullness and drowsiness. Having abandoned restlessness and worry, he dwells at ease within himself, with a peaceful mind. He purifies his mind from restlessness and worry. Having abandoned doubt, he dwells as one who has passed beyond doubt, unperplexed about wholesome states. He purifies his mind from doubt. Brahmin, Suppose a man were to take a loan and apply it to his business, and his business were to succeed, so that he could pay back his old debts and would have enough money left over to maintain a wife. He would reflect on this, and as a result he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Brahmin, suppose a man were to become sick, afflicted, gravely ill so that he could not enjoy his food and his strength would decline. After some time he would recover from that illness and would enjoy his food and regain his bodily strength. He would reflect on this, and as a result he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Brahmin, suppose a man were locked up in a prison. After some time he would be released from prison, safe and secure, with no loss of his possessions. He would reflect on this, and as a result he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Brahmin, 
Suppose a man were a slave, without independence, subservient to others, unable to go where he wants. After some time he would be released from slavery and gain his independence. He would no longer be subservient to others, but a free man, able to go where he wants. He would reflect on this, and as a result, he would become glad and experience joy. Again, Brahmin, suppose a man with wealth and possessions were traveling along a desert road, where food was scarce and dangers were many. After some time he would cross over the desert and arrive safely at a village, which is safe and free from danger. He would reflect on this, and as a result he would become glad and experience joy. In the same way, Brahmin, when a bhikkhu sees that these five hindrances are unabandoned within himself, he regards that as a debt, as a sickness, as confinement in prison, as slavery, as a desert road. But when he sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within himself, he regards that as freedom from debt, as good health, as release from prison, as freedom from slavery as a place of safety. When he sees that these five hindrances have been abandoned within himself, gladness arises. When he is gladdened, joy arises. When his mind is filled with joy, his body becomes tranquil. Tranquil in body, he experiences happiness. Being happy, his mind becomes collected. Quite secluded from sense pleasures, secluded from unwholesome states, he enters upon and dwells in the first jhana, which is accompanied by thinking and pondering, and filled with the joy and happiness born of seclusion. He drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses his body with his joy and happiness born of seclusion, so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this joy and happiness. Brahmin, suppose a skilled bath attendant or his apprentice were to pour soap powder into a metal basin, sprinkle it with water, and knead it into a ball, so that the ball of soap powder be pervaded by moisture, encompassed by moisture, suffused with moisture inside and out, yet would not trickle. In the same way, Brahmin, the bhikkhu drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses his body with the joy and happiness born of seclusion, so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this joy and happiness. This, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. Further, Brahmin, with the subsiding of thinking and pondering, the bhikkhu enters and dwells in the second jhana, which is accompanied by internal confidence and unification of mind, is without thinking and pondering, and is filled with the joy and happiness born of collectedness of mind. He drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses his body with this joy and happiness born of collectedness of mind so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this joy and happiness. Brahmin, suppose there were a deep lake whose waters welled up from below. It would have no inlet for water from the east, west, north, or south, nor would it be refilled from time to time with showers of rain. Yet a current of cool water welling up from within the lake would drench, steep, saturate, and suffuse the whole lake, so that there would be no part of that entire lake which is not suffused with the cool water. In the same way, Brahmin, the bhikkhu drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses his body with the joy and happiness born of collectedness of mind, so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this joy and happiness. This too, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. Further, Brahmin, with the fading away of joy, the bhikkhu dwells in equanimity, 
mindful and clearly comprehending, and experiences happiness with the body. Thus he enters and dwells in the third jhana, of which the noble ones declare, he dwells happily with equanimity and mindfulness. He drenches, steeps, saturates and suffuses his body with this happiness, free from joy, so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. Brahmin, suppose in a lotus pond there were blue, white or red lotuses that have been born in the water, grow in the water and never rise up above the water, but flourish immersed in the water. From their tips to their roots they would be drenched, steeped, saturated, and suffused with cool water, so that there would be no part of those lotuses not suffused with cool water. In the same way, Brahmin, the bhikkhu drenches, steeps, saturates, and suffuses his body with the happiness, free from joy, so that there is no part of his entire body which is not suffused by this happiness. This too, Brahman, is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. Further, Brahman, with the abandoning of pleasure and pain, and with the previous passing away of joy and grief, the bhikkhu enters upon and dwells in the fourth jhana, which is neither pleasant nor painful, and contains mindfulness fully purified by equanimity. He sits suffusing his body with a pure, bright mind, so that there is no part of his entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. Brahmin, suppose a man were to be sitting covered from the head down to his feet with a white cloth, so that there would be no part of his entire body not suffused by the white cloth. In the same way, Brahmin, the bhikkhu sits suffusing his body with a pure, bright mind, so that there is no part of his entire body not suffused by a pure, bright mind. This too, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to knowledge and vision. He understands thus, This is my body, having material form, composed of the four primary elements, originating from father and mother, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion. And this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. Brahman, suppose there were a beautiful barrel gem of purest water, eight-faceted, well-cut, clear, limpid, flawless, endowed with all excellent qualities. And through it there would run a blue, yellow, red, white or brown thread, a man with keen sight, taking it in his hand, would reflect upon it thus. This is a beautiful barrel gem of purest water, eight-faceted, well-cut, clear, limpid, flawless, endowed with all excellent qualities. And running through it there is this blue, yellow, red, white, or brown thread. In the same way, Brahman, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to knowledge and vision, and understands thus, This is my body, having material form, composed of the four primary elements, originating from father and mother, built up out of rice and gruel, impermanent, subject to rubbing and pressing, to dissolution and dispersion, and this is my consciousness, supported by it and bound up with it. This too, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, 
he directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body he creates another body having material form, mind-made, complete in all its parts, not lacking any faculties. Brahman, suppose a man were to draw out a reed from its sheath. He would think, this is the reed, this is the sheath. The reed is one thing, the sheath another. But the reed has been drawn out from the sheath. Or suppose a man were to draw a sword out from its scabbard. He would think, this is the sword, this is the scabbard. The sword is one thing, the scabbard another. But the sword has been drawn out from the scabbard. Or suppose a man were to pull a snake out from its slough. He would think, this is the snake, this is the slough. The snake is one thing, the slough another. But the snake has been pulled out from the slough. In the same way, Brahman, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to creating a mind-made body. From this body he creates another body having material form, mind-made, complete in all its parts not lacking any faculties. This too, Brahman, is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the modes of supernormal power. He exercises the various modes of supernormal power. Having been one, he becomes many, and having been many, he becomes one. He appears and vanishes. He goes unimpeded through walls, ramparts, and mountains as if through space. He dives in and out of the earth as if it were water. He walks on water without sinking as if it were earth. Sitting cross-legged, he travels through space like a winged bird. With his hand he touches and strokes the sun and the moon, so mighty and powerful. He exercises mastery over the body as far as the Brahma world. Brahmin, suppose a skilled potter or his apprentice were to make and fashion out of well-prepared clay whatever kind of vessel he might desire. Or suppose a skilled ivory worker or his apprentice were to make and fashion, out of well-prepared ivory, whatever kind of ivory work he might desire. Or suppose a skilled goldsmith or his apprentice were to make and fashion, out of well-prepared gold, whatever kind of gold work he might desire. In the same way, Brahman, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, steady, wieldy, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to the modes of supernormal power, and exercises the various modes of supernormal power. This too, Brahman, is a visible fruit of recluseship more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, Wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the divine ear element. With the divine ear element, which is purified and surpasses the human, he hears both kinds of sound, the divine and the human, those which are distant and those which are near. Brahman, suppose a man traveling along a highway were to hear the sounds of kettle drums, tambours, horns, cymbals and tom-toms, and would think, this is the sound of kettle drums, this is the sound of tambours, this is the sound of horns, cymbals and tom-toms. In the same way, Brahman, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to the divine ear element. With the divine ear element, which is purified and surpasses the human, 
He hears both kinds of sound, the divine and the human, those which are distant and those which are near. This too, Brahman, is a visible fruit of recluseship, a more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of encompassing the minds of others. He understands the minds of other beings and persons, having encompassed them with his own mind. He understands a mind with lust as a mind with lust, and a mind without lust as a mind without lust. He understands a mind with hatred as a mind with hatred, and a mind without hatred as a mind without hatred. He understands a mind with delusion as a mind with delusion, and a mind without delusion as a mind without delusion. He understands a contracted mind as a contracted mind, and a distracted mind as a distracted mind. He understands an exalted mind as an exalted mind, and an unexalted mind as an unexalted mind. He understands a surpassable mind as a surpassable mind, and an unsurpassable mind as an unsurpassable mind. He understands a collected mind as a collected mind, and an uncollected mind as an uncollected mind. He understands a liberated mind as a liberated mind, and an unliberated mind as an unliberated mind. Brahmin, suppose a young man or woman, fond of ornaments, examining his or her own facial reflection in a pure, bright mirror, or in a bowl of clear water, would know if there were a mole. It has a mole, and if there were no mole, it has no mole. In the same way, Brahman, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to the knowledge of encompassing the minds of others. He understands the minds of other beings and persons, having encompassed them with his own mind. This too, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of recollecting past lives. He recollects his numerous past lives, that is, one birth, two births, three, four, or five births, ten, twenty, thirty, forty, or fifty births, a hundred births, a thousand births, a hundred thousand births, many eons of world contraction, many eons of world expansion, many eons of world contraction and expansion, recollecting, there I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance, such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my span of life. Passing away from that state, I re-arose there. There, too, I had such a name, belonged to such a clan, had such an appearance. Such was my food, such my experience of pleasure and pain, such my span of life. Passing away from that state, I re-arose here. Thus he recollects his numerous past lives in their modes and their details. Brahmin, suppose a man were to go from his own village to another village, then from that village to still another village, and then from that village he would return to his own village. He would think to himself, I went from my own village to that village. There I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, spoke in such a way, and remained silent in such a way. From that village I went to still another village. There too I stood in such a way, sat in such a way, 
spoke in such a way and remained silent in such a way. From that village I returned to my own village. In the same way, Brahmin, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to the knowledge of recollecting past lives, and he recollects his numerous past lives in their modes and their details. This too, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye, which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings fare according to their kamma. Thus, these beings who were endowed with bad conduct of body, speech, and mind, who reviled the noble ones, held wrong views, and undertook actions governed by wrong views, with the breakup of the body, after death, have reappeared in the plane of misery, in the bad destinations, in the lower realms, in hell. But these beings who were endowed with good conduct of body, speech, and mind, who did not revile the noble ones, held right views, and undertook actions governed by right views, with the breakup of the body, after death, have reappeared in the good destinations, in the heavenly world. Thus, with the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing inferior and superior, beautiful and ugly, fortunate and unfortunate, and he understands how beings fare in accordance with their kamma. Brahmin, suppose in a central square there were a building with an upper terrace, and a man with keen eyesight standing there were to see people entering a house, leaving it, walking along the streets and sitting in the central square he would think to himself, Those people are entering the house, those are leaving it, those are walking along the streets, and those are sitting in the central square. In the same way, Brahmin, when his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, the bhikkhu directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the passing away and reappearance of beings. With the divine eye which is purified and surpasses the human, he sees beings passing away and reappearing, and he understands how beings fare according to their kamma. This too, Brahmin, is a visible fruit of recluseship, more excellent and sublime than the previous ones. When his mind is thus collected, pure and bright, unblemished, free from defects, malleable, wieldy, steady, and attained to imperturbability, he directs and inclines it to the knowledge of the destruction of the contaminants. He understands as it really is, this is suffering. He understands as it really is, this is the origin of suffering. He understands, as it really is, this is the cessation of suffering. He understands, as it really is, this is the way leading to the cessation of suffering. He understands, as it really is, these are the contaminants. He understands, as it really is, this is the origin of the contaminants. He understands, as it really is, this is the cessation of the contaminants. He understands, as it really is, this is the way leading to the cessation of the contaminants. Knowing and seeing thus, his mind is liberated from the contaminant of sensual desire, from the contaminant of becoming, and from the contaminant of ignorance. When it is liberated, the knowledge arises, it is liberated. 
He understands destroyed is birth. The holy life has been lived. What had to be done has been done. There is nothing further beyond this. That, Brahmin, is a sacrifice that is simpler, less difficult, more fruitful, and more profitable than all the others. And beyond this, there is no sacrifice that is greater and more perfect. Excellent, venerable sir, excellent. It is as if someone were to set up what had been knocked down, or to point out the way to one who had gotten lost or to bring an oil lamp into a dark place, so that those with eyes could see what was there. Just so, Master Gotama has expounded the Dhamma in various ways. May Master Gotama accept me as a lay follower from this day forth, as long as life shall last. And Master Gotama, I set free the seven hundred bulls, seven hundred bullocks, seven hundred heifers, seven hundred goats, and seven hundred rams. I grant them life. Let them be fed with green grass and given cool water to drink, and let cool breezes play upon them. Then the Blessed One delivered a graduated discourse to Kutadanta on generosity, on morality, and on heaven showing the danger, degradation, and corruption of sense desires, and the gaining of renunciation. And when the Lord knew that Kutadanta's mind was ready, pliable, free from the hindrances, joyful and calm, then he preached a sermon on Dhamma in brief, on suffering, its origin, its cessation, and the way leading to its cessation. And just as a clean cloth from which all stains have been removed receives the dye perfectly, so in the Brahmin Kutadanta, as he sat there, there arose the pure and spotless Dhamma I, and he knew, whatever things have an origin must come to cessation. Then Kutadanta having seen, attained, experienced, and penetrated the Dhamma, having passed beyond doubt, transcended uncertainty, having gained perfect confidence in the teacher's doctrine without relying on others, said, May the Blessed One and His Order of Bhikkhus accept a meal from me tomorrow. The Lord accepted by remaining silent. Then Kutadanta Seeing his consent, rose, saluted the Lord, passed by to his right, and departed. As day was breaking, he caused hard and soft food to be prepared at his place of sacrifice. And when it was ready, he announced, Venerable Sir, it is time, the meal is ready. And the Lord, having risen early, went with his outer robe and bowl and attended by his bhikkhus to Kutadanta's place of sacrifice and sat down on the prepared seat. And Kutadanta served the Blessed One and his bhikkhus with the finest foods with his own hands until they were satisfied. And when the Lord had eaten and taken his hand away from the bowl, Kutadanta took a low stool and sat down to one side. Then the Blessed One, having instructed Kutadanta with a talk on the Dhamma, inspired him, aroused in him enthusiasm and delight in the Dhamma, rose from his seat and departed. <laughs>